Hi everybody, I'm Jen Johnson and this is Thought by Thought Healing where I talk about everything related to mind-body syndrome and TMS and recovering from chronic symptoms. And I love a good success healing story and today I have that. So today I am interviewing Robert Enzor who's gonna talk about his story of having a million different symptoms and even having five doctors say that they thought that he had an autoimmune disease and being able to recover from all of those. He had a ton of food sensitivities and um, recovered completely and now eats whatever he wants to. So we get into a lot of variety of different discussions in this, including the role of journaling. And we talk about what he believes to be the source of uh, of, uh, that fear voice in his life. And um, it's really interesting conversation. So I hope that you enjoy and I hope that you feel inspired and encouraged that you too can do this journey and you can heal from your own symptoms. All right, guys, thanks for watching, and I will talk to you later. Bye. All right, let's get started. So today I have a guest named Robert Enzer with me today. So thank you, Robert, for being here. Thanks for having me. I love to hear a good healing story, which everybody does. So um, let's get started with just a little bit about your your story your symptoms things like that right. yeah it's a very long story a long and complicated story so i will mm-hmm. uh i'll try and keep it brief okay um, so yeah i mean it really started in childhood with various food intolerances citrus intolerance and a, a steadily growing list of intolerances and um steadily worsening hip and back pain but it didn't get really bad until February 2019, um, when I just finished writing writing a novel, and my back hurt terribly uh, just getting up out of a chair. I mean, yeah. the the pain persisted for weeks. It just kept going on and on. So I went to see an osteo and uh, osteopath. She thought I had ankylosing spondylitis, and um, not mm-hmm. an official diagnosis by any means. Can you can you tell us what um yeah. just for people who don't know what what is that and what would from um from what your symptoms were why would she assume that that's what you had quote unquote Well yeah I had digestive difficulties to put it mildly and um okay. very bad back pain that just wouldn't go away for weeks mm-hmm. and um ankylosing spondylitis is basically autoimmune arthritis of the spine and autoimmune disease is uh, where the the immune system attacks usually a joint or just any kind of tissue, depending on the disease, and um, yeah, so yeah, I I I, go- I got back home and I googled ankylosing spondylitis. Saw As these, we all do, all these pictures of crooked spines, and I got told that my spine was going to turn into bamboo and what have you. Oh. And uh, I, I, the symptoms did fit. I mean but it was by no means an official diagnose, diagnosis. Okay. Yeah. And um, so with, with autoimmune disease, the mainstream medicine says basically they're incurable and just, you know, they want to manage the inevitable decline with uh, keep it as painless as possible with various medications. The, the only option that the mainly mainstream option that holds out hope for a full reversal of symptoms is the autoimmune paleo uh, functional medicine approach, which is diet based. So the idea is you take a diet that starves your bad bacteria, and um, this somehow prevents inflammation from occurring and um, reverses the disease. Okay. So I, Did you try you that? Know, yeah, I went for that approach. And um, hmm. because they have success stories, you know, people who, kind of reverse the disease to the point where they've got few or no symptoms, but they've got to maintain this incredibly strict diet um, supplement regimen. Yeah. Um, but, you know, that seemed pretty good at the time because it was in a bad way. And um, and it did work to begin with. You know, I, I got relief. I would call it placebo relief, to be honest, in yeah. light of everything else that happened later on. I'm so, curious... Uh, yeah, go on. Since you, since you brought up placebo, um, I'm curious if yeah. you feel like you experienced a nocebo effect from her um, 
her uh, diagnosis. I know you weren't officially diagnosed with that, but her suspicion that that's what you had. Do you think oh. you had a nocebo response? Oh, Did your symptoms yeah. get worse? Okay. Yeah, definitely. And and with all the doctors I saw later, I mean, five doctors thought I had autoimmune, but it was never actually confirmed. Um, oh, wait, five doctors thought you had an autoimmune disease yeah 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 i mean some said celiac some said crohn's and then you had the the crohn's was the the leading contender that okay was um yeah and yeah and I, I got a nocebo effect out of it but it's important to remember that i only got the nocebo because i believed them yeah and i started to heal when i basically dismissed maybe not the diagnosis but at least the idea that it's the prognosis the yeah. idea it's incredible that's when I really, and that was, you know, when I found Sano, which is much later in the story. Um, okay. So anyway, getting back to the whole thing with the diet, basically what would happen is I would drop a certain food. It started with lactose. I dropped dairy and I suddenly felt so much better. I thought, okay. wow, this is definitely it, right? Yeah. Like people mm -hmm. are correct. Yeah. And those were very naive, didn't understand placebos at the time. And um Basically, I, I still gradually got worse over time. And I got temporary relief every time I dropped another food group like gluten. And then eventually I had to drop starch, you know, which is a big one. I mean, yeah. very difficult to live without starch. And um, and your your life yeah. is getting smaller and smaller. But yeah. but each time you're doing it, you're having this this relief of symptoms so it seems to be encouraging you to continue yeah, exactly. to go down this path exactly yeah mm -hmm. that's exactly what happened but this is the okay. thing i mean where there's a placebo there's a nocebo if you're reliant on some externality or especially with you know tms type things if you're reliant on an externality to make you feel better mm -hmm. you you know like i say avoiding a food if you then have that food or something like it all of a sudden you've got terrible symptoms yeah right so every predictive placebo coding turns yeah in, turns into an nocebo they are completely interconnected so anyway um yeah eventually i went to the doctor um because my my acupuncturist talked me into it and acupuncture was another interesting episode because the first time i went i got i got um quite a big improvement the second time it was horrendous yeah i, I, I was you know, paralyzed with pain it was awful okay to clarify your story so yeah. you i thought you had gone to five doctors are we going back in in so the we, story we're going back in time yeah okay it's a gotcha. complicated story it's really yeah. is okay i have to have it all written out otherwise it just becomes a mess <laughs> so yeah anyway eventually I, I started going to doctors and um they thought I had, um, yeah, they thought I had autoimmune disease. One of them, a functional medicine doctor, said that I was the worst autoimmune patient he had ever seen. Ugh. Ever. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. That's a dubious honor. Yes. And, and knowing what we know, I mean, that's just going to send your body further into fight or flight and symptoms. So yeah. not exactly. helpful. Yeah, big nocebo, but uh, you know, ultimately, I, I had to believe him, and uh, I did did uh, various tests. Uh, my GP talked about Gilbert syndrome, which you know is a mild, benign liver abnormality that doesn't really cause any symptoms. Okay. So that was obviously pointless. Um, the, he wanted to do a gluten test, and you know, believing what I did about diet at the time. If I'd eaten gluten at that time, I probably would have wound up in a hospital, or at least mm -hmm. I would have had much worse symptoms for two weeks. Let's let's say maybe two weeks. Yeah, which just yeah. confirms what we are, are always saying in mind body that their symptoms are real. You're yeah. really experiencing these things. Yeah, um, yeah, and um, so, hmm. oh yeah, and I went for an ultrasound, and that was pointless, and. Uh, there was there, nothing showed up and uh, eventually I got around to a gastroenterologist who wanted to do a gastroscopy basically shove a camera tube down my throat to see if I had a a bleeding or perforated ulcer um anything urgent that needed um repair 
Okay. And also, he also wanted to do an X-ray um, to see why I couldn't, you know, bend and I couldn't get up off the um, the the bed thing. So both of these okay. procedures were cancelled due to lockdown. Okay. But okay. you know, at that at that point, I was glad because every time I saw a doctor, I got worse, and you know, they kept making these concerned noises and throwing out these diagnoses that were very dire and incurable, even though nothing was ever confirmed. Uh, so I, uh, at that point, I just wanted to go alone and and do it on my own. Um, and lockdown really gave me the excuse. Okay, so it was actually pretty good for me. What does that mean? You wanted to go it on your own. Because well, you, you hadn't know, discovered TMS yet, right? No, no. I figured at that point I could still do it with diet, but you know, oh, that can happen. Okay. Uh, but I, I basically I, I wanted to do it on my own because I just kept getting worse every time I saw a doctor, and yeah. also the, the um, getting around the hospital. You know, I needed a wheelchair to get around this giant hospital one time to go for that pointless ultrasound, and that was very demoralizing. I could kind of hobble around my house and just about get up the stairs. But to go long distances, I need a wheelchair. Okay, so you were you were um, massively impacted in your diet because your yeah. sy- your primary symptoms were 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 they pain and like abdominal well, pain? Where yeah, were I've got a full list here of all the symptoms. It was severe chronic back and hip pain, chest pain accompanied by shortness of breath, anxiety, depression, mm-hmm. gingivitis, insomnia frequent urination, mm. wisdom related infections as well. Okay. Um, intolerant to almost everything, you know, gluten, lactose, starch, eggs, soy, onion, nightshade, artificial sweeteners, even citrus. Um, and then I had like IBS type diarrhea and constipation, yeah. headaches, uh, severe chronic fatigue, um, cold intolerance, uh, uh, massive foot swelling at one point urinary pain, uh, dizziness, wrist and hand pain, which, you know, they may, if, if I'd really gone into it, they may have said repetitive strain or something. Or so is it tunnel. fair to say like all over body symptoms? Uh, almost. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it was, I was a complete mess. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and, um, I'm sorry. I'm really sorry. Well, yeah. I mean, ultimately, of course it's, it was worth it in the end. Mm-hmm. so yeah there's a happy ending yeah Thankful. okay um, so here you are then yeah. it's locked down and your procedures are are canceled thank goodness yeah. um and yeah. um are you what happens well at that point basically um i was completely desperate and i um yeah i, I, I was raised church of england anglican uh but like most okay. anglicans at that point i was an agnostic okay well like most people who are you know kind of christ uh christened anglican and all that kind of thing you know pretty much agnostic but i was i was so desperate that i i prayed i promised christ i would spread whatever message he wanted me to spread if i recovered mm-hmm. and then mm-hmm. Shortly after that, I get a, um, well, I, I got more resolve as well. I just kind of decided that I was sick of being so pessimistic about everything. And I just had to believe that I would recover. Yeah. I, I just got sick of it. I, I couldn't stand the idea that I was going to be stuck, paralyzed, in unbearable pain from every direction. But maybe years and years, slowly starving to death. I, I couldn't stand it. It was, there was, um, and also yeah. I, I couldn't take the mainstream medical approach because I couldn't even have, you know, ibuprofen painkillers because they had a little, they have a little bit of starch in them. Right. Mm-hmm. That set me off and gave me pain and abdominal pain, you know, maybe diarrhea. So um, I was kind of stuck. There was, there was like no other way out basically. So anyway, I, uh, I get a recommendation from Amazon um john sarno's book healing back pain yep and um you know i was reading the reviews and people heal just from reading it so i figured well look i mean you could you don't get side effects from reading a book which i think is a mark sofa quote i thought okay. the same thing 
You don't get side effects from reading a book. I get side effects from everything else. Anything I have to put in my body is kind of a no-no at this point. Mm -hmm. So yeah, why not? Let's let's give it a whirl. So I bought the book and also it's short. Mm -hmm. So I bought the book, but I, I left it on my nightstand for two months because I couldn't quite get my head around it at the time. It was like, he's talking about back pain, chronic pain. I thought I had autoimmune disease. So I, I didn't think it, I was in the right kind of, um, I, I didn't think I was the right demographic for the book. Mm -hmm. Although I did have back pain. I thought, oh, it's, it's, it's inflammatory. And it's, it's not me. Pain. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and, and also I struggled to get my head around the idea that all of these symptoms were psychogenic, that originated in the mind. Because yeah. Because it was so physical and so diffuse, systemic everywhere. Yeah, what was your holdup with that? Like, what was it about that that you couldn't understand? Was it scientifically or was like a kind of like, a that can't possibly be me? It can be other people, but not me. Well, yeah, I, I guess there, there always is an element of... Um, there's an element of kind of vanity that you, you don't want to think you've got psychological problems, right? What is that about? Like, why is it that it's more prestigious that we can have physical, yeah. have physical pain, but it's considered weak to, to be emotionally injured by things that happen to us? I, I, it doesn't make any sense to me, but I hear you. Yeah, it's, it's the desire for approval. Yeah, it's conformity, which is which is at the root of all of all these problems. It's the desire to for others to approve and um, the fear of disapproval, the fear of people thinking, oh, you're crazy or something. I want you to say that again. It is the desire for approval that is at the root of all this. Yeah, it's the, the desire for approval, for love and approval and to be liked basically, and the, the fear of disapproval and isolation that causes repression is really is the root cause of it. I'll have to if think you... about that. I, I, I definitely think that is true for a large number of people. Um, yeah, that's the main myself. obstacle as well. What? Uh, it's the main obstacle to healing as well, as well as causing repression. Because, I mean, you wouldn't repress something that is socially desirable. Like, there would be no threat of condemnation. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The kind of socially undesirable or unacceptable things that get repressed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, keep going. So. Okay, uh... so anyway, yeah, basically, uh, I, I finally was persuaded to read Sano when I had a dream. And I dreamed for a while before this, I've been dreaming about eating bread and chocolate, which, of course, being severely gluten intolerant. I just thought, what, what is this? You know, why yeah. am I dreaming about this? Is it just wish fulfillment? Like, I wish I could eat bread. Um, but I can't. But actually, it was my unconscious suggesting to me, this is what you should do. Mm -hmm. And then I and then the penny dropped, you know, when it all clicked when I had another dream, which was um, that I was on a podcast and I was holding up Sano's book saying, a diet's okay, but this is better. You, you know, better do, book. you you better just do that now. I'm sure you have a Sarno book in front of you, right? Oh, no, I haven't. <laughs> but, um, oh yeah, I do actually. <laughs> oh, thank goodness. My body prescription. Okay, yeah, there we go. Right, let's make the dream come true then. I think mine. Yeah. Oh nope, it's not. It's over there. Never mind. Okay. Either well, anyway, one. Anyway, diet's thing. okay, but this is the stuff. You know, this yeah, is better. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Dream come true. And um, it was that dream that persuaded me to read Sano. Yeah. Basically, because yeah. I, I had a bit of an inkling about dream analysis and that there was something in dreams and. Um, so yeah, I, I read Sarno and um, basically I kind of, yeah, it, it made a lot of sense to me. And I, it, but it wasn't until I started applying what he was saying to myself and started thinking about repressed emotions that I really started getting an improvement. Yeah. And, uh, and then I, I went for a, a three and a half mile walk um, with my mom talking about repressed emotions from years ago. And 
three and a half miles for me at that time was a massive deal. I, I, I was, was able to keep going without much pain. There was a dull pain in the background, but it didn't stop me from walking like it used to. Yeah. Okay. So at that point, I was convinced. I mean, that was proof. Yep. Yeah. And really, from from then on, I didn't really have any 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 doubt that that this was it because it was just so obvious. When you get that big an improvement in symptoms, it was just so much bigger than anything I'd had with my my diet. You know. Okay, so really at this point in time, you're you've gone for the three and a half out a mile walk and yeah. you're sold on TMS. Um, that belief, uh, I'm just curious of your perspective on how, um, how important that was that belief that you had, that it was TMS, yeah. how important was that for your healing progress and or journey, um, in the grand scheme of things? What role do you think um, knowing that you have TMS plays in this? I think it's absolutely crucial. And to be honest, um, you, you do see cases where people have psychotherapy, but they don't make a link between the repressed emotions that they're expressing in therapy mm -hmm. and their physical symptoms. And they sometimes they get some improvement physically, but more often than not, it's kind of insignificant. Yeah. So I think that tells us really that the belief in a mind or knowledge, I mean, really, in the link between mind and body is crucial. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely crucial. So did you doubt like, okay, so I, I hear you saying that you, you believed it was TMS um, going forth from there. Did you have any moments of doubt where you had to struggle with this and reconcile anything? Um not serious doubts but at one point um my foot swelled up massively okay like maybe 50 percent bigger than it usually is and then the other one swelled up and it's oh. there's it was so big that i struggled to put my uh shoes on but wow. I, I kept walking forced my limp around five miles and forced myself to keep walking yep but uh you know that was quite concerning but I, I'd read about symptom imperative in Sano and it, mm -hmm. it just fit the bill. It's like, yeah, you know, I, I conceive of um, the idea of symptoms as a distraction from repressed emotions, which is the core of Sano's core concept. Yeah. And it's the idea is I'd seen through the, the, the back pain distraction. So I had another distraction thrown at me. Yeah. That fell yeah. outside mm -hmm. the standard range of disorders that Sano talks about you know he doesn't really talk about massive feet <laughs> you know feet swelling up yeah I and I, I just want to pause and just connect with you a little bit on this because I think I, yeah. I was similar to you in that I as soon as I saw and understood TMS I was like that's that is a hundred yeah this this all makes yeah. sense and that's me and I and although there were times that you know I went like I wonder if this could be the symptom imperative and there was a bit of wondering I definitely chose to just buy in and mm. I think that that served me very well I didn't yeah. have foot things but I had a lot of other things like that that would come come my way and I would just say this is probably TMS it's probably yeah. the symptom imperative and I'm curious for you as you treated your foot swelling. Um, how did that pan out for you when you treated it like it was TMS? Well, uh, you know, it, it it took me about two weeks to get rid of it, and uh, the the how I got rid of it was by journaling about um, grief because my dad died of a of ALS when I was um, okay. mm. nineteen, I think, and. Okay. Um, so I started journaling about that. And uh, as, I, as I was journaling, within 10 minutes, my foot deflated as if someone had stuck a pin in the whoopee cushion. Al almost a normal. Yeah. Yeah. Swelling just went down. And, you know, at that point, it was obvious that, you know, basically whatever, whatever gets thrown at me, this is symptom imperative. Just keep going. Yeah. Okay. So journaling, um, journaling sounds like it was a big part of your journey yeah it was, yeah. Yeah. It was, it was very useful um but i i overdid it you know i oh, kept you did 
for for 15 months okay i, I turned it into a, a ritual so it's like a replacement for the diet kind of thing albeit a much better replacement than barely eating anything okay it was much better than sticking to this ridiculous diet it was uh -huh. up to an hour a day of journaling but it was it was literally just a, a kind of a replacement placebo after a while anyway mm -hmm. um in that if i if i skipped the session i'd wake up the next morning well i'd have insomnia for one and i'd feel terrible and i'd have symptoms and then i'd have to journal again to get rid of it that's very interesting um did you use visualizing much in your healing journey no i i, I kind of used that towards the end when I was already pretty much healed and just had some niggling symptoms. And then that replaced the journaling. That was the, that was the next ritual placebo that I kind of replaced journaling with. So how did you, so, okay. So I, I get this. So your brain had become reliant on journaling for safety and how did you, how did you move out of uh, that space then? Yeah. I, I believe that basically my interpretation of Sano at that time was you need to express the repressed emotions, which is not strictly true. In fact, the majority of his patients didn't have to do that. At least they didn't need psychotherapy or journaling. They just needed to, um, they just needed to accept his diagnosis, believe they had TMS, understand that it's a distraction from repressed emotions and resume full normal activities. Mm -hmm. that's what the majority of them had to do mm -hmm. so when um, you look back do you feel like you didn't need to do your journaling not for that long anyway not for that long yeah and you know i mean you hear stories of people healing with all kinds of methods um people do get good results with diets you know people get results with um with all kinds of things uh surgeries and um medications even people improve with medications and the common denominator and journaling and meditation and visualizing and the common denominator across all of these different approaches is that people believe in them you know it works if you believe in it and so that is why i emphasize belief as being the most crucial factor because i mean everyone who improves or heals is is doing it whether consciously or unconsciously they believe they can heal because they believe in whatever method they've picked mm -hmm. if you see what i mean i do see what you mean mm -hmm. now, there's obviously more than a placebo effect in certain therapies because they do placebo controlled trials but even so um yeah i think belief is very important and i think it's just because i believed i had to keep journaling and that if I didn't, I'd get even more symptoms coming back. And also by, by maintaining these rituals, what I was doing was, like I said, every placebo can turn into a nocebo. So if you rely on journaling or, or whatever, or meditating, whatever you diet, let's say, yeah. to feel good, then by definition, if you kind of lapse in your regimen, if you forget to journal or you eat a banned food or, whatever, or you forget to meditate, you you then feel worse. Mm -hmm. So it's um, by giving externalities the power to make you feel better. You also give them the power to make you feel worse. Mm -hmm. And for me, anyway, the the only thing that wasn't a placebo was the certain knowledge that the power to heal lies within. And finally, only recently have I got rid of all the rituals completely. So in, in the earlier part of our interview, you talked about um, uh, becoming Christian. So I'm curious, how, how does God play into that for you? If the, if the power is within, which, which I am not disagreeing with you, but how does God, what is, where, where's God in that story? Um, well, I think the, the crucial turning point for me was what I call the divine bargain, where I, I basically... Uh, promised Christ I'd spread whatever message he wanted me to spread if I recovered and I think that kind of um, spiritual element is why I was able to have so much faith that I could recover when I found Sano I, th I think that uh, that in it, that gave me the belief so he gave you the power to believe 
that you could that you could that you could heal yeah uh-huh. Yeah, okay. I think that was it, really. Um, and uh, you know, you you read about this in the Bible with um, the woman who who had a hemorrhage for twelve years and touches Jesus' <laughs> clothes, and then he turns around and he turns around and says, "Your faith has made you well." Yeah. So the mm-hmm. idea is, that it was her faith that made her well, and um, that faith and belief really is the crucial factor in those healings. Hmm. Yeah, and in that case, her faith is in him, right? Yeah, but also, you know, Christ had total faith that he could do it. When he approached a sick person, you know, he he knew he could do it. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's belief, yeah, on, he... faith, faith on both ends, really. Okay, okay, yeah, so, and... sorry, go ahead, I'm cutting you off. Um. Yeah, no, no, carry on, yeah. So we, you, you mentioned um, grief and what what when you're talking about repressed emotions and journaling which you do it sounds like you do value your time in journaling oh yeah i mean yeah it was a it was a it was a ritual but it was a far better ritual than the diet and it was at the time i needed it because at the time i didn't understand that you know so many different things are placebos and would you suggest that people sorry would you suggest then that people if you were walking with somebody who was in chronic pain would you suggest journaling i would first of all recommend sano's books and then you've got the once you've had a pretty comprehensive education and um if, if that doesn't do it for you if you don't start making serious progress there then something like journaling or meditation can help definitely because okay. i mean this is just human nature people kind of need rituals they need they need to do something or have an externality because it makes it easier to believe you can heal if you're doing something now it's it's not strictly necessary if you um to do all these things but it, you know looking back at, at the time for me it was because of my level of understanding I didn't understand that belief really is this important at that time. So therefore I needed to do, I needed to rely on certain activities. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I'm, I'm not dissing journaling or anything. I mean, they're, they're very useful tools and yeah. Um, yeah, I needed it for many months. So, yeah. yeah. So you worked through um, in your journaling, what, um, what are primary emotions? Um, I know you mentioned grief. Um, what, what would you say your top two emotions that you worked through in journaling was? Yeah, um, uh, grief and anger. So okay. I had a lot of repressed anger because I was bullied severely at school. And, uh, you know, just kind of forgot about it, thought, oh, well, that's school. You know, most people get bullied and yeah. just kind of rationalized it away and forgot about it. Okay. It wasn't until I, I journaled about it that I realized just how angry I was. Mm-hmm. And I started improving. You know, I, I could eat more. I could um, exercise more. The pain went down. So, yeah. uh, would you exp- did you experience that relief in symptoms like pretty um right after journaling or what was that like for you? Oh, instantaneously as I was journaling. Okay. In- and was it just releasing it? Yeah, yeah. I was I was expressing the emotions in a fairly blunt manner. Like I'm furious at so and so for such and such. Yeah, I'd get specific and I'd be I'd be blunt about it rather than you know mincing words and trying to be nice about it because of course it's just a journal. Nobody else sees it. You can burn the pages. You can destroy it. Right. Yeah. yeah. Did you go back and stand up for yourself? Oh, what you mean, like confront a bully? In your journaling. Oh, um, not so much. Hmm. Not so much. It was it was more just um, reliving the memories. Even helped hmm. just hmm. writing down in detail the memories of what happened. Yeah, and also yeah, expressing a bit of anger. And, and then, some grief. and what about grief? Did did working through grief and journaling? Did uh, sorry, grief and anger were they both expressed through journaling for you, or was there any other? Um, ways that you just want to share with people that were helpful for you in kind of processing those repressed emotions yeah. well um 
like yeah, I, I did have the occasional talk with my mom, but most of it was um uh, journaling, really. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it, was, it was journaling, and I kind of applied some of the ISTDP, which I picked up from uh, Dr. Schubiner's book and yes, um, Arlene Feinblatt's section in the Divided Mind. Um, I kind of applied that mm. to journaling, and I figured, okay. well. Yeah, it's about expressing the emotions you don't really need a therapist necessarily to express those emotions if you can identify them yourself yeah and just write about it isn't that effectively the same as talking about it yeah yeah that's very interesting okay um i have two two more questions for you um mm-hmm. in the in the anger part of it was did um did forgiveness ever come up for you was that a part of it in in, in the main kind of healing phase where i, I made like 95 percent progress uh no I, I was getting so much mileage out of expressing the anger that i figured if i if i forgave that would somehow be repressing so it, it wasn't necessary to heal but um eventually yeah i, I did forgive at, at some point you've just got to let it go you know yeah and that had psychological benefits not so much physical because at that time I was pretty much mostly recovered. That makes sense to me. Definitely psychological. And I would say that, you know, um, when you express anger, you, you haven't really got rid of it. You know, it's not fully purged from the system. No, it's just not repressed anymore. Yeah. I mean, forgiveness kind of helps to really get out and purge it. Yeah. Move on from it. Helps you to integrate and then move on in life. But it's yeah, the ISTDP is quite good in that you you express the anger before you forgive. I mean, if you just jump straight to forgiveness, then it's some some really big trauma. Then yeah, especially when you don't know what you're forgiving. Yeah, like yeah. The, the impacts of somebody's actions. We need yeah. to forgive them for the impacts that they had on us. And I love that about ISTDP because you're recognizing that before you're jumping to that. Um, yeah I mean, it's it's a pretty comprehensive sweep of all the emotions and just gets it all out so yeah it's uh it's good okay so i want to v- revisit this um going back to the beginning you were autoimmune disease um diagnoses were thrown around with you the yeah. lockdown happens you you don't get the test that would give you a diagnosis. So you, we don't know for you what you would have gotten. Oh, I'm a mystery. I'm a complete, I'm an enigma. Right. But, but I am curious since, I mean, I, I have a similar story to you in as far as like how many symptoms and how small it made my life. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, but I yeah. didn't have any autoimmune disease diagnoses thrown at me. Um and so I am, I am curious, um, for you, as you come out of this, do you think that autoimmune diseases are part of mind body? Um, what's your perspective on that? Well, I, I had a client, um, I do a bit of mind body coaching. I, I had a client, um, Ozzy, who he's a success story. He's, he's gone public with it. So I, okay. it's okay to talk about it. And, um, he had ankylosing spondylitis for 20 years, com- medically confirmed, totally diagnosed officially with scans proving that he had a degenerated cartilage. Of course, over 20 years, it was pretty bad. And blood tests showing high inflammation. You know, he he, he had AS. Yeah. And um, after four consultations with me, um, he's pain-free. He doesn't have symptoms. Yeah. So, I mean, that's that's all the evidence I need. Yeah, but there is scientific evidence, though. I mean, not no smoking gun, of course, but there is some evidence. Like, there's there's plenty of evidence showing that stress causes inflammation. Um, and pretty much everyone agrees in the medical world that stress is a factor that it plays a role. Right. right. Immune- heart disease, cancer, all these big chronic illnesses. Uh, and then they generally say, oh, well, there's also genetics and diet and what have you. Um, but, you know, n- n- what we now know about epigenetics, how genes can be switched on and off depending on stress, environmental factors, how they're processed by the brain. Yes. Yes, you know? please. Yeah. 
So yeah, um, th there is some evidence. And there's also a study by um, Smythe and colleagues showing uh, that the a written emotional disclosure study and they had about 50 or so rheumatoid arthritis patients who wrote about the most stressful event in their life. I think they only had four sessions. So this was maybe an hour or two hours of writing. And there was an average improvement in, in their symptoms and overall disease activity. So including inflammation levels of 28%. And that was only with a couple hours of journaling. Can you, um, after this interview is over, can you send me the links of the books we've talked about and that link to that research? Year, yeah, um... yeah, there's a lot of the research in my um, recovery memoir, The Mind Solution. It, there's a load of stuff in there, but I will send you the link separately. Great. Okay. And then that's a great transition too. You have written a, a few, a couple books. So let's briefly talk about them. Um, yeah. 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 Well, the, yeah, there's the mind solution, the recovery memoir. I've got that here. Um, okay. And, um, nice butterfly on the front. <laughs> and, um, yeah, that basically talks about the whole journey and exactly what I did to get rid of my symptoms. And in the back, there's a whole load of, uh, scientific research, a lot of success stories as well of other people who I've found who've, um, healed autoimmune disease. Um, oh, cool. Many, okay. completely, many of them completely, uh, including uh, Rebecca Tolin, whose primary diagnosis was chronic fatigue, as you know. Yeah. Uh, but she was also diagnosed with um, Hashimoto's. Right. Uh, so, you know, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And yeah, she very kindly wrote a 2,800 word contribution. Cool. Um, and Ozzy's in there, of course, and there's several others. And what else have I got here? Yeah, um, just a lot of um, a lot of research and some ideas about my body, and um, and I will put the link I to also, the book. In I also lay, lay out, yeah, I also lay out my kind of uh, philosophy on this. See, I um, I basically think that behind this whole pain as a distraction thing is um, an archetype. Uh, Jung set out the theory of archetypes as kind of inner personalities um, that control people's behavior without them realizing mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. unconscious. And um, I would say that this these symptoms are basically um, the, the activity of uh, the deceiver archetype, which is basically the, the role of the deceiver archetype is to distract from the unconscious and the unpleasant emotions and truths in the unconscious through various distractions, through uh, pain, fear, desire, ambition. And it, it tends to root people in the physical and distract from spiritual and unconscious factors. And so basically the idea is whenever I got a symptom, I would think, oh, this is just a deceiver trying to distract me. I personified it. And that helped. Okay. It's kind of like an inner devil type figure. Okay. And so then how would you treat that distraction? Well, if, first of all, just recognizing that it is, um, that it is the activity, that it is a distraction, um, that it is a distraction, that it's trying to divert your attention away from um, unpleasant things in the unconscious. Um, really. And, and that it is just the deceiver trying to distract you. I mean, that would be one. And then the other thing would be uh, just to try and increase belief that it is um, that, you, that you can recover. And um, yeah, and, and one of the main things, uh, especially for Christians, is this kind of divine bargain. You know, I mean, these things work. I mean, you had something similar to you. You... Um, you prayed for help and you asked and you received, if I understand correctly. Yeah. Yes. Yep. I, I mean, yeah. Yeah, it works. And I do think that is part of the, a big part of the reason why both of us had the confidence when we found Sano to just keep going and ignore all the distractions thrown at us. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of people, 
people talk about um, your relationship with your symptoms in many different ways. And some is just like to say, no, this is fear. I'm not buying into it. Um, another is to talk to it like it's a, a child that's scared and we need to be loving and compassionate and um, and uh, almost say to the child, there's nothing to be scared of. It's just my body. I'm safe. Um, so I'm, so it sounds like to you, it was more like, I'm not buying into this. I'm no longer giving the deceiver any t- attention. Oh, yeah, it was I'm, a wall. I'm going to live my yeah. life. Yeah. yeah, it was it was a war. Uh, it was a war for attention. And uh, I, I just ignored it, like the classic Sano approach. But you know, I, I respect other approaches work. I mean, there's plenty of evidence for that everywhere. Um, and I think the key, the common denominator across all the approaches is the nobody's in, in the mind body field is encouraging you when you get a symptom to just absolutely freak out and panic you know yeah. and get frustrated and furious no nope. so with the idea of like accepting the symptom listening to it observing it you're um it's almost as if there's an annoying person trying to get your attention and you're just calmly you, you're, you're not getting angry at them you're not getting provoked you're just sort of calmly saying oh that's interesting yeah and, uh, you know and so it yeah it does kind of work it, it nullifies the distraction strategy to a to a, a good degree because you're not you're not overreacting yeah, yeah. um you, you're not reinforcing uh by getting extremely scared yeah so I think there's, there's some common ground with the different approaches and that nobody's nobody in this field is encouraging you to catastrophize and spiral basically Excellent. I agree. Absolutely not. There's, there are different approaches as to how to not fear the symptoms Mm -hmm. and they look and feel slightly different, but all of them encourage less freaking out. Less fear. Less, less fear. Yeah. Yep. You know, there, uh, there's a lot of people that push back on this idea that TM, well, when they're first introduced to TMS, it can feel unattractive to realize my symptoms are a product of fear. um, And we just don't like to acknowledge that but it is in truth yeah. the very thing that it is yeah mm. it's just masked as it's masked as something else that if we're going to go with your analogy of the deceiver he is very deceiving and he calls some of those personality traits that you're talking about he calls them good and then we buy into them and yeah, yeah. i mean the idea is this little voice is like if you don't listen to me you're something terrible is going to happen yeah i'm trying to keep you safe and that's the lie of fear yeah. the lie of fear is that i'll keep you safe when actually it creates the very thing you're afraid of. Absolutely. And And those personality traits inside the body either, you know, say that last part again, not just inside the body. So, I mean, say if you fear a certain type of person and, um, that, that pattern and and obsess about it, paradoxically, you're going to get sucked into those kind of patterns again and again. Yeah even with external factors through the very act of trying to avoid it. Absolutely. It, it's, so it's it not is. just a, an interior thing. It's no nope. fear is a, is a self-fulfilling prophecy. Mm-hmm. I absolutely agree with you. And um, yeah. And so taking those fears and saying, I'm, I'm not, I'm not scared of you. Yeah. It's just recognizing that it's a load of nonsense. Yeah. But it, that it is an attempt to just distract you and it, it's not necessarily going to happen. It's not going to happen. It really yeah. helps calm, help calm me down. Um, yeah, that was, that was helpful. I agree. Okay. Um, so if people want to get a hold of you or contact you, how would they do that? Well, um, I've got my website now. Um, okay. It's, not the fanciest website, but it does a job. Okay. Uh, Robert RobertEnter.com, and it should come up on on the uh, search engines. Okay. And uh, yeah, like I said, I do a bit of mind body coaching, so you can, if you want, you can book a consultation. And the book's on Amazon. Um, so if you type Mind Solution, the the Mind Solution, or even Sano, into um, Amazon, that should come up on the first page somewhere. Okay, and I will put all those links in the show notes yeah, so people can just oh i, I do have on. another book here which is a bit of christian fiction okay christian. uh the the son of christ it's called 
the son of christ yeah oh okay is that on amazon too yeah that's on amazon and uh it's about a man who has uh terminal cancer and uh basically the doctors give him three months left to live and he he is he prays to christ he's healed and then he goes christ gives him a vision and he goes on a mission to the holy land to find a lost gospel no not the holy land to um he goes to Patmos in Greece to find a lost gospel written by John the Apostle. Okay, okay. It's a bit of Christian fiction for your Christian um, followers. Audience. Yes. All right, cool. Well, Robert, thank you so much for sharing your story and for inspiring those of those people that are still on the journey of healing. Um, we need to hear yeah. all this stuff. So Thanks thank for you having so much. Me. Yeah. yeah. All right, everybody. Bye, and I'll see you next week.